My name is Haley Fonseca. I am the student director of the Women's Center. Welcome to our 10th annual conference, More Than a Woman. This is our fourth day of our week-long virtual series. We're so glad that we're able to share this experience with you all um, in the midst of a pandemic. So thank you for your time this morning and thank you for those who registered and for those who have joined us uh, in the previous days this past week. And with that, I'll pass it over to my assistant director, Shannon. Hi, uh, my name is Shannon Reed. I'm the student assistant director at the San Francisco State Women's Center. Um, also happy to be here. Really glad to see everyone joining us and also happy to welcome our guest speaker today, Amber Riley. So Amber, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hi everyone, my name is Amber Riley. You may know me from a little show called Glee that I was on for a really long time and other things. Um, I'm an artist under the name Riley. Y'all may know me as Mercedes Jones. That was my character on Glee also. And I just wanna say thank you so much, Shannon. Thank you so much. It's, it's Hallie, right? Or Haley? Haley. Haley, Haley, yeah. and um, to my good friend, Tony, uh, who actually recommended uh, that I did this. Um, I love speaking to people. I love telling my story. Um, and uh, they reached out and asked me if I wanted to talk about Unmute Me, which is a hashtag and an organization that I've started. And today I just wanna to talk to you guys about finding your voice and how this industry pushed me to find my own voice. Sorry if you see me looking to the right, my notes are over here. <laughs> it's a really, really interesting setup I have. <laughs> so um, I grew up in Compton, California. Yes, that Compton. Yes, like the movie. Um, and I absolutely love my upbringing. I did not grow up with a lot of money. Um, but because of that, it, it made me become such a creative and imaginative person. So if our lights were out, my sister and I played, um, what am I drawing on the ceiling with the flashlight? Or um, we had dinner by candlelight. So from a very young age, I learned to take what it is that I was given and make something great from it. So, um, <clears throat> But of course it did have its, set, have its setbacks. Um, I did grow up in a neighborhood where there was a lot of violence. I saw a lot of that growing up. Um, I did suffer through racism with a lot of the schools that I, I went to with a lot of the teachers. Um, and that actually was my first taste of um, being silent and wanting to be invisible. Um, I had no access to music or arts programs. I had no access to Hollywood. <laughs> and I had this love for entertaining. I knew I wanted to be a singer. I love to act. I actually have a really funny story about um, the first time my parents put me in a tap dancing class because I wanted to be a tap dancer so bad. And my dad came backstage before I started um, the before our program started and he goes are you okay and I go huh and he says they said that my daughter was back here crying I wasn't crying it was another kid but I love the attention so much that I just started crying so that was my <laughs> that was my <laughs> first taste of like hmm this acting thing might it might be for me um but I, yeah, I always felt like I was destined for greatness, but it was kind of like everything around me um, told me otherwise. But I had an amazing family. I had amazing women in my life, mothers, sisters, aunts, friends. So I went for it. I went after my dreams and started singing in little bars. The, the funniest story is I was singing at this really small bar and it was so small that the bathroom, the restroom was literally next to the stage. So in between songs or when I was talking, you could literally hear the toilet flush. So no, it has not always been glamorous people. <laughs> it was a little bit of a struggle, but like I said, a lot of my struggle kind of pushed me to find my voice and kind of pushed me to be creative, to get to where it is that I wanted to get to. And that's how I booked Glee. Um, it was my first television role. I was so excited. Um, 
And how could you not be? I mean, I was making more money than I'd ever imagined. I was taking trips to places that I never thought I'd go to. If you know me, you know that my favorite food is pizza. And my dream was just to go to New York because I heard they have the best pizza. Sorry, Chicago. I heard New York had the best pizza. Made it to New York, tried pizza for the first time was on a private jet people knew who I was I got to sing and dance every single day like it was a dream come true and it was all good at first but like everything in life problems arise and the feeling of gratitude is always great but I have to say it doesn't always serve you I had to figure out as these issues arise at my job, at my work, although I'm grateful and people from the outside looking in would probably see what it was that I was doing and be like, if I was in that position, I would not complain. I would not bring up issues. I would just go to work and do my job. But that feeling and being taught that you're supposed to be grateful instead of knowing your value and understanding hey, I'm being paid for this because I have, I'm bringing value to this project also. We're both benefiting from this. It's not just you doing me a favor. I auditioned for this. I'm bringing value and you're paying me and I'm doing a great job. So I should have the autonomy to talk about my environment and, and I should feel safe when I'm coming to work every day. But alas, in my youth, <laughs> um, I felt it necessary to keep my head down and to not make waves. Uh, the fear of losing my job, the fear of losing this status, what I've wanted, my dream, the fear of blowing my first chance, it kept me from speaking up for myself in a lot of times when I should have. Um, and it severely affected my mental health. I already deal with um, anxiety and depression. And at that time, I didn't know that I dealt with anxiety and depression. As many of you know, that's not something that we in, our, in the Black community stress. Thank God this generation is putting more stress and focus on it. But mental health was just not a thing. We had a uh, we had Jesus church <laughs> in prayer. That's what, that's what we were taught, but we never were taught to talk about our feelings. Um, and that's a whole, that's a whole other issue. Maybe I'll come back and talk about that one day. Um, but mental health, yeah, I, I dealt with anxiety and depression and I didn't necessarily know that that's what it was, but I understood that um, suppressing what it is that it, you feel um, something will brew inside of you and it erupt anyway. That's literally anxiety. Holding and suppressing feelings, suppressing the truth is literally anxiety. And so I'm going through depression. I'm going through anxiety while I'm on the show. I don't really know how to stand up for myself. I don't really know how to speak for myself. I don't really know how to advocate for myself. Anxiety is getting worse. And then I remembered something. <clears throat> I remembered that nobody goes to the beach to not ride the waves. That's no fun. So I did start trying to speak up for myself and it was not received well. <laughs> it wasn't received well. <clears throat> um, at the end of the show, of course, it was a little contentious between myself and between our producers and, you know, it happens. It, it wasn't all bad. I do want to say that it was not all bad on the set, but, you know, things happen. And at the end of the show, I left maybe not with a lot of resolve, but I did leave the show with so many lessons learned. Um, and so... With all of that, we moved to the present day. We're in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> Racism, homophobia, transphobia, the killing of Black people at the hands of police, and so much more is happening. And I don't know if it's age. I don't know if it's maturity. I don't know if it's 
because I've suppressed what it was that I felt for such a long time, but I just felt pushed to start speaking up. And I was terrified. I was terrified to recognize what was happening in the world because I lived in what I like to call a glee bubble for such a long time. The world was beautiful, it was magic, it was songs and breaking out in songs and dancing. It was all of these great things, but in the real world, in the actual world, it was none of that. Nobody's breaking out singing Don't Stop Believing in the middle of the street. <laughs> um, and it just seemed so intimidating to speak out. And I know that that may sound silly to most, but telling my, giving an opinion in a world of Black Twitter <laughs> it isn't a joke. Um, I've seen people say things and it seems like they it ended their career. But then I started thinking about how, what the silence did and how it made me feel. And I started being really introspective. And I said to myself, you finally have a voice with no ties to a network controlling what it is that you do and say, because when I started, you know, when social media started, I was already on television. And so I couldn't really say anything. I mean, I could have, but I was terrified. Um, and then I started thinking about my community and I started thinking about my niece who's growing up in this crazy world and, and she idolizes me and wants to be just like me and has said it since she was two years old. What world am I gonna leave behind for her? What example am I going to set for her? I can sacrifice a gig. I can use my voice and be an asset instead of a, a hindrance. Am I gonna make the decision to take on this responsibility? Because it is a decision. Activism, whatever it is that you want to call it, it's a decision. We can totally take care of ourselves and just our homes and not worry about others. But if you feel moved and, and pushed to speak out when you see injustice, even if it is on your behalf, I'm sure a lot of you are in classes and have to have conversations with your professors. You might have to have a hard conversation with someone that's in your class. And as women, I feel like we are Sometimes our voice is not taken seriously. We can't be afraid of how we'll be received. It's the biggest thing that I've learned in therapy. How someone is gonna receive the truth has very little to do with whether or not you speak the truth. So, I ultimately came to the conclusion that fear is gonna keep me from my destiny. And so we moved to the day where I finally spoke out <laughs> on Twitter. <laughs> um, I've been speaking out about, you know, Black Lives Matter. I've been speaking, I have been speaking out about uh, trans lives matter, Black trans lives matter. I've been, I had been speaking out about so many different things. One day on Twitter, I got on and uh, old castmate, Samantha Ware, she stuck up for herself. She shared her experience. She told her story about the trauma that she experienced on set. And when I saw the hate that this woman was getting, there was no way that I could sit there and not have her back. There was no way that I could sit there knowing and, and let people victim blame. Let people, watching people gaslight her and, and try to change her experience. And I knew because I was, I am, you know, who I was on the show. I knew that me adding my voice would add validity to what it was that she had to say. And so I spoke up on her behalf 
and I gave her my support. And just doing that alone made me feel free. Telling that truth as uncomfortable or as ugly or as problematic as it would, as it was, because it did get a lot of backlash. I felt it necessary to stand in that truth, no matter how crappy everyone around, no matter what they were saying, I felt it necessary to make sure there was no benefit for me doing it. <laughs> That's how I knew it was the right thing. There is nothing in it for me. There was nothing in it for me but the truth. So it was bigger than gossip. The way that on sets, the way that Black people are treated and the way that white people are treated on set and other people of color are treated on sets, it's very different. Extremely different. We are made to feel like we're disposable. We're dime a dozen. So I couldn't let her stand alone and let people believe that this is just an isolated experience. It's an isolated incident. No, it's a problem. In my industry, across the board. And I knew that it was a problem because as soon as I spoke out, so many actors spoke out after, known and unknown, new and actors that have been doing it for years, text messages, tweets, DMs, private messages from so many people saying that they had the same experience from a girl, I just posted one on my Unmute Me page, which I'll get to what a mutiny is, but it was a, an, an, a, a background actor that was hired on a set. She's light, light skin. And they were like, hmm, she's a little bit lighter than the girl. They literally put this light skinned black girl in blackface with no thought of how it made her feel or how it would make another person feel seeing that. It's a problem across the board. So here I am thinking, you know, that imaginative, that creative, when there's a problem, let me use my imagination. Let me figure out what am I going to do with all these stories? Because now I have a responsibility. I can't, I can't just let these people, you know, put themselves out there. And I wanted to create a safe space. So I did start Unmute Me. I, it started as a, ha a hashtag, hashtag Unmute Me. And it's just about unmuting yourself. It's about creating a safe space to share and hear other people's stories. Because when you hear another person's stories, story that sounds like yours, it makes you feel less alone. And because of that, I've had the opportunity to actually speak to my old producers, the old create, the, the creator of the show that I was on, the co-creator of the show that I was on. I've gotten to speak to network executives. Have I lost jobs? Yes, <laughs> I have. <laughs> have I had to walk away from opportunities because now I have the language to say what it is that I'll deal with? and what it is that I want, and I want it in writing. Yes, I've had to walk away. I've had to set a precedence. I'm okay being the first. If it means that it's gonna change what's happening in my industry or in, uh, uh, an attitude in general for my community, an attitude in general for women across the board and people of color. Unmute me has become my baby. I have so many things in the works 
for it, it's become less about telling stories, hot goss, <laughs> drama, and it's become more about getting on these sets and changing the language, changing the narrative, getting on these sets and changing the culture adding mental health and 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 letting them know how important that is talking to these network executives about having a liaison on set that these actors can speak to as actors we are vulnerable that's all that we're taught any acting class you go to the first thing that they're going to teach you about is vulnerability in front of lots of people we're vulnerable from eight to anywhere from eight to 18 hours a day on a set. Where's the protection? Where is the protection? Where's the care? So all in all, I've learned that speaking up isn't always easy. The truth is not always gonna make you feel free. I know you guys have heard the expression, the truth will set you free. It's not always gonna make you feel free, but the truth does expose. And sometimes it requires sacrifice. And I really want you to ask, ask yourself that question. What am I willing to sacrifice? Because when you go against the grain and you do something different than what everybody else is doing, they're going to make you look like you're crazy. <laughs> They're going to make you look like you're complaining. They're going to make you look like you're not grateful, but you know you. You know your character. You know the place that you're coming from in your heart. As long as you're sticking to that, I don't think that you can go wrong. So the next time, you know, you want to speak up, understand and be sure that you know that it's not always going to be taken the way that you mean it. <laughs> it's not always going to be taken the way that you mean it. And you know what? Because I spoke up, I was able, like I said, to connect with all these producers, tell my experiences. A lot of them have respected what it is that I have to say and where I'm coming from. Um, I've been able to give my services and become a consultant for a lot of them on set. And hopefully, you know, I'm just one person, um, but I'm, I'm hoping, you know, that I'm the start of a, a, a little avalanche that more people will um, take what it is that I have started and run with it. Um, finding your voice may not be easy, but it is very necessary. We all have a responsibility to be a light for our communities. And don't let this world keep you from making waves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amber, for such an empowering speech and for being vulnerable and sharing your story. We all really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, thank you. If anyone also wants to pipe up in the chat, feel free. Um, sorry, my roommate's listening in too. Um, <laughs> and they're really excited. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. I'm gonna um, go ahead and get into the Q&A a little bit. If anyone, any of our participants also wanna ask a couple questions, um, there's a Q&A feature. I also posted a Q&A on our Instagram and we'll be checking in on that too. But um, for now, Amber, I just want to go back to how you were saying in your speech that a lot of creators are kind of put in a box and forced to be a certain person or act a certain way. In your time as a creator, when have you felt like your most authentic self? I feel like when I sit with things and I'm honest about <clears throat> how I feel and I move forward in that honesty, that's when I feel most authentic. Can you name a specific time maybe where you were honest with yourself? Oh man, I think um, when I started my EP, I feel I felt the most authentic because 
I was terrified. <laughs> I was terrified to do it. And, you know, really insecure about like my writing and stuff and very insecure about, you know, my, my own sound and have tried it a million times, you know, before doing the music thing and just going in fearful and doing it anyway, because I know that music is my saving grace and it's what makes me happy. And it's one of my gifts to this world. And I have the desire to make people smile and feel something again. Like I think doing it anyway, seriously made me feel real, authentic, made me feel, yeah, the word, I guess the word is authentic. Definitely. I definitely felt that in, well, your BGE song on your new EP and your video, I could just see like how raw it was in that video and how you were truly like portraying yourself yeah. and your story and your culture. So yeah, I definitely felt that. I could definitely see that through your music. Thank you. Um, but yeah, it's a great video. For those of you who haven't seen it, go check it out on YouTube. I thought it was great. I watched it again this morning. Um, aesthetically, it's really beautiful. So I definitely, I definitely felt that. I could definitely see it. Um, as for, I guess, other people in the creative, I guess, well, not the creative, the entertainment industry who feel like um, they're also being put in a box. What can we do as consumers to dismantle that tokenism in the entertainment industry wow i mean that's a mouthful right mm -hmm. there that yeah. is a question <laughs> um, i think it it would take a collective of 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 people to start saying no and to speak up and um me personally i've just felt like i'm going to create my own projects and you know everybody's not going to do that everybody's not a writer everyone isn't a producer and I, I just think that people have to stand their ground and and kind of create a standard for themselves um and just go with that I just realized I was even but yeah definitely like using using your platform and um just advocating for others, I think, is the best way to do that. And that's something that you're already doing as a creator, but as consumers, I think it's important to hold ourselves to that standard as well and be critical of what we watch, um, you know, and what we share and what we post. Mm -hmm. um, but for perf the performers, the performers that are also in the audience, what advice do you have for preserving their own identity? Hmm, preserving your own identity, preserving your own identity. <laughs> this is gonna this is gonna be funny. Therapy. <laughs> I'm a very huge advocate for therapy. I the reason I say that is because therapy makes you look at yourself, makes you sit with yourself, it makes you, it makes you you're very introspective. And as an artist. I feel like people will always identify with you when you are authentic. There's that word again, but I, I do. I think um, when it's coming from a, a real pl place and also not paying attention to what everyone else is doing and doing what feels right and what feels natural to you because you're always going to find your audience. It may not be, you know, my audience may not be the same as, you know, Ariana Grande's or Beyonce's. There's so many people in this world, you know, and your people will find you. Your people will find you. I like that. <laughs> I'm going to like sit with that for a second. <laughs> but I mean, I guess you kind of already answered that um, in your own or answered this next question in your own experience. But what do you do to preserve your own energy? as an entertainer? Oh man, I say no when mm -hmm. I want to say no. I rest when I need to rest. If I don't want to do it, I'm not doing it. I, I fell into that hole of just saying yes to everything because people would tell me that this is good for you and this is what you should be doing. And sometimes it was, <laughs> I'm not always right. <laughs> but um, for me, saying no to things was like, 
chef's kiss. It was the best decision that I ever made. Starting to say no. <laughs> and what are the steps, I guess, that you've taken or that you would re recommend other people take to learn that radical self-love and that self-care to say no in the first place? Um, I think you have to eliminate the fear of people's reactions. And that doesn't mean that you have to be a jerk or you don't have to be rude. <laughs> um, but it does mean that you have to put yourself first. And it can be done in such a, it can be done in such a nice way. Like, you know, I've I've had to tell people, I don't, I don't dance around my no anymore. The answer is no. I'm gonna tell you no. <laughs> if I feel like you deserve an explanation, I'll give you what. If I don't, you not get what. But I think that I think that. I think that putting yourself first is the most, you know, radical way to show yourself love. That's so empowering. Thank you. <laughs> what do you, this is transitioning a little bit, but I guess in terms of knowing your own worth for you personally, what work are you most proud of? Oh, uh, um, my recent project that I'm doing, I'm very proud of it. Um, I sold my first TV show to NBC and my whole life, if, if, if all my friends that know me, I've always said, I am a leading lady. And I've always just said that about myself. I'm a leading lady, I'm a leading lady. I don't care what this world is trying to tell me that I have to be the background character or the best friend or the conscious Jiminy Cricket and on the little shoulder. I can be, I'm a leading lady. I am beautiful. People want to hear my story too. There are people that look like me that want to hear my story. And I've stuck with that and I've stuck to my guns and I found a, a community of people in my, my you know, uh, uh, career that agree and we, we've gone for it and, you know, somebody bought it. So that's, I'm really proud of just sticking to my guns. Wow, yeah, we have a couple of people in the chat like asking about what work you're doing and what what else you're gonna be putting out. Um, but another, well, a work that, I mean, I it really inspires me and is really empowering to me is your movement, Unmute Me. Um, where do you see that movement going? Wow, I mean, I really wanna take it to networks and on sets and I really want it to become a place where people can come. I mean, we, we, we're we already kind of doing that, uh, where people can kind of come for guidance. Um, I mean, I've had so many stories of people who have been sexually harassed on set and told HR and nothing came from it or <clears throat> have been um, verbally assaulted on set or, you know, just certain things. And And I think the, I feel like I have a whole statement about a mutiny. If everybody wants to read it, it's on my page. But my main thing is pointing out microaggressions and holding power structures accountable. That's really what I want a mutiny, a mutiny to do. Holding power structures accountable for the, 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 the environments that they are set, ending, ending silence, and pointing out microaggressions because the way that a lot of like the issues in this world are kind of coming to the forefront is they're not so in your face as much. There are small microaggressions then that, and microaggressions really can silence you because they make you second guess yourself. They make you think, was that, is that really what they meant? Okay, I don't wanna say anything and that's not really what they meant. I don't want them to think I'm sensitive, so or like they can't work with me or or I'm going to be, you know, they make you second guess yourself and that creates silence. And so I want a mutiny to be a place where you can kind of come and we can advocate on your behalf or give you resources to help you you know figure out and I've I've spoken to lawyers that will do, you know, give their time and it's just it's a lot. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be this much work and it's taking a while, but I really want it to become a thing on set to where these power structures have to care now. I kind of want to instill a little bit of fear in them. Tread lightly. 
Yeah, it's definitely not an easy task starting a movement. So (laughs) I could definitely understand that. I know so many people are so grateful that you're using your platform to speak up on their behalf and give them that safe place. Um, But do you see that? Do you see the movement leaking in, like how you were saying that you just sold your show? Do you see it leaking into your future work? Oh, yes, absolutely. I think even consulting with people and and how to um, talk to their agents about... um, what to put in their contracts. Uh, Mm -hmm. I can say one thing specifically, I I walked away from a gig because they wouldn't let me bring in my own hair and makeup. And that may sound very minute to some people, but I have trauma on set from being told like my hair is not manageable. Or I I show up to the photo shoot and they're like, oh, this is the darkest foundation that we have. It's either too dark or it's too light. You know, I, I've, I've gone to places where they burnt my hair out, Wow. you know, um, or can we just straighten it? And I'm, my hair is natural, you know, so it's, um, not, it's, it's, it's about, I, I mean, I felt, I didn't feel like a human. <laughs> I didn't feel like, like a person. And, you know, Becky comes and sits next to me and looks like a supermodel <laughs> and I, <laughs> I look like the before. And she's the actor, like, you know, so it's, um, it's, a it's, it, even that consulting with people about what to put in and what's important to you. And I, I got pushed back just from that, just from asking for a hair and makeup or having the decision, the final decision of who does my hair and makeup. I'm, I'm even saying you guys find the person and I will work with who it is that you guys find, but I need to make the final decision. Having autonomy over your own look hair, makeup, things that are going to be with me the rest of my life, my skin, you know, that was an issue for them. So I had to walk away. Mm -hmm. It's definitely important to know, know your own worth and just know the values that you have before going into entertaining others and pleasing others. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely super important. And for this next question, I feel like that kind of could bleed into your answer, Mm -hmm. but what is your definition of feminism and womanhood? Feminism to me is, it's a mindset of we're all equal and equal in value. We're all equal in, and, and the fight for equity. Um, and womanhood to me is about just honing in on your power and holding on to it. Do you feel that's something that you've learned recently or is that something that's been a long time coming based on your experience? Man, I feel like (laughs) it ebbs and flows because you forget, you forget who you are and life brings ups and downs. Um, I, I feel like it's something that I've learned. You know, I'm 35 years old, so I've, I'm not old, but (laughs) I've, I have lived um, a life and I have learned, I think I have different values than I did when I was younger. And Mm -hmm. one of them is peace of mind, happiness, and the way that I treat others, the way that I allow people to treat me, I feel like honing in on your power has a lot to do with all of those things. Right. Honing in on what you said about, I guess, like having that value as a child or like wanting to teach yourself that or learning that in that, I guess, over time. Um, What do you think we can do to create more opportunities for children in the entertainment industry? Hmm. That's a hard question because hmm. I mean, I definitely feel like we should, well, at least in California, I would love to see more theater programs as opposed to everyone just wanting to be on television or in movies um, because that's my background. And I learned a, I learned a love for the actual art. Um, 
I personally, I personally do not, I know we need it, but I personally do not like children being actors on set it's just so it's such it's not a unless you're a a helicopter parent and my you know my parents were helicopter parents so when I was acting in on set when I was younger I was kind of protected from from all of that but I still even you know I was like a size eight and I was going out for roles as the fat kid you know what I'm saying which is fine you know what I'm but in my mind, because I was being taught fat is bad, fat is bad, fat is bad. I had such a terrible complex growing up. So that's a tricky question because <laughs> Hollywood is such a um, volatile place. It can, it can be a volatile place and it can be um, a very materialistic place. So that and kids is like, It's an interesting combination. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. And I mean, children are just losing their autonomy, like right before our eyes and we're just consuming it. So it's something that I think we can all hold ourselves accountable to as well. And like I said, be critical of what we're watching. And that's definitely something that can also be encompassed into unmutiny too, Mm -hmm. is advocating for children. So I definitely hope, hope to see that. And I know a lot of children would appreciate having that platform as well there for them. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think Children, child actors just have it so hard and it's just such a toxic environment. Just, I don't know. Shouldn't be, shouldn't be a thing for What's your a lot of children. Kids. <laughs> yeah, right? I know. That's what I'm saying too. And it definitely, I feel like this conversation is just having like a lot of people think more critically about like just what we're consuming in general. And I mean, being in the pandemic, it's like there's so many like different shows and like we're always watching TV, always on media and just consuming all these things and we don't even realize how it's shaping our perspective of the world and our own identity. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Is that something that you've experienced during the pandemic? Um, my experience with the pandemic was hard at first. So when the pandemic started last March, I was coming out of a really deep depression and and I was dealing with agoraphobia. So I actually was kind of okay with being at home, not gonna lie. <laughs> was I was kind of okay with being at home but honestly it made me sit with myself even more and um I don't think that I will be the person that I am not to say that the uh, the pandemic was necessary or anything like that I'm not trying to find you know say that it's positive or whatever but I will say that I try to use the time that I had in the silence where I didn't have any obligations to really sit with myself and work on myself. Um, And I really believe that I am here. I I had my own voice in my head for once. I wasn't juggling other people's, it was just me. So I can definitely, definitely say that time alone, that silence, that sitting with myself, that letting myself be uncomfortable, letting myself, you know, recognize the ugly things and working on that has, has helped me be who I am right now. And I hope that I continue to just grow. I hope you do too. And I hope for everybody else that, who's experienced that during the pandemic, um, everyone's life just kind of slowing down and having to take a look at your life and being like, what is really serving me and what am I serving and what do I need to walk away from Mm -hmm. um, is really important. So I feel like the pandemic has been, I mean, obviously bad, but good good in some ways for some people. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, all all across the board, I think a lot of people have had to really take a lot of alone time and sit with themselves in that way. But um, this is my last question before I open it up to the audience for a Q and A. But with, I guess, what you've learned from the pandemic or in general as a creator, what would you want to tell your childhood self? Um, I would tell my childhood self to get in therapy as soon as you're at an age where you can do that on your own. And I would tell my childhood self to be patient with well, one thing that we, I don't feel like we are we're so hard on ourselves. Um, 
And it's hard to find that balance of pushing yourself, but also being patient with yourself. So find that balance. Thank you for taking all my questions, Amber. I really appreciate it. Um, we have, I'm going to do a time check really quick. We have another 15 minutes left um, mm -hmm. of this session. So if you don't mind, I'm going to turn it over to a Q&A from the audience. I don't know. Are you able to see these questions as well on your end? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Do you want to just answer them yourself then? Sure. Okay. Um, let me see. Macy Walters asked, um, have you got any new music coming out? I absolutely do. <laughs> new music is coming out very soon. I'm working on my album right now. And it's been kind of tough because we are in the middle of a pandemic, but I'm getting it done and I'm going to be releasing some singles pretty soon. Um, Gladys asked, you mentioned that sometimes speaking up requires sacrifice as a woman of, ooh, excuse me, as a woman of color and trying to navigate the system that is racist, it is scary to go against that. How should we initiate conversation rooted in liberation and critical to know it's okay to speak up and use our voice as a way to dismantle oppressive systems? Are you a poly major girl? <laughs> um, listen, I, I, I think it's, um, I, I feel like when you have a fire inside of you about a certain subject, and it just won't let you go and it's holding on to you. Um, I think that that is your cue, God, universe, what, however it is that you wanna say it to, that is pushing you into your destiny. And I think that you should um, go for it and go, go for it with the mindset that everyone may not agree. Everyone may not like what it is, but on the other side of fear, there is liberation. On the other side of fear, there's freedom. On the other side of fear, you're doing your part to dismantle oppressive systems. So use your voice and also be as knowledgeable as you can be. I don't, I also don't, I know I've been saying find your voice and speak out, but I also just don't believe in, in, in not sitting with yourself and choosing your words wisely because words are so important. Language is so important. Um, be as concise as you possibly can and um, come from a place of confidence because you've done the work yourself. So that's that's what I can say. It's scary, but it's necessary. I am currently Mugda. I think it's Mugda Kukarni. My doctor's name is Kukarni, Dr. Kukarni. Um, I am currently a grad student getting a master's in education with an emphasis in social justice and equity. Yeah. In my classes, we talk a lot about how we can make classrooms be safe, learning spaces for students, and being mindful of the communities where students come from. How do you think this can be applied in the field of work, uh, in the field you work in? Also a huge fan of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, listening. I think the way that that can be applied um, in, oh, somebody said they are a poly major. The, <laughs> Gladys said she is a poly major. See, I knew it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, I, I believe making it important for everyone's opinion to be heard and making it safe for their opinions to be heard and their experiences and not, um, not trying to gaslight or not trying to villainize or not trying, just to listen. Um, one thing that I've learned in meditation is to not judge. I don't judge myself when I'm meditating. I don't judge myself when I'm in the silence. I observe. And I think a lot of people need to observe more and not react and not judge. And I feel like that would really help in my line of work. And I'm glad that you're in a classroom that, that you feel safe because um, that's really dope. And that's, that's definitely not, um, <laughs> that's not a thing that's always happening in classes. 
Um, thank you for sharing. This is Abby. Um, thank you for sharing about your anxiety and depression. Mental health is a difficult topic. And even though things are getting better now, what do you think about the state of mental health issues in the US today? Oh gosh, you got a couple of days? Um, it's not good. <laughs> Um, I can speak specifically for my community. One of the things that I want to do and I, I talk to my friends about um, a lot is bringing mental health and meditation and different ways of, of coping um, into the neighborhoods that I grew up in. Um, I don't think that the U.S. makes it a, a priority like they should. Um, I think there are so many factors uh, burnout, would you say, i.e. burnout, accessibility, discrimination? Yeah, there's so many factors um, that contribute to mental health issues, especially in inner cities. So yeah, that's a, I, it's a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, how, what, how are we looking on time? We still have like another 10 minutes. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna try. What are some instances when you'd gotten a gig only for it to be taken away because of your advocacy? How did you handle it? And how do you keep yourself motivated in the movement? Uh, I think for me uh, personally, the way that I stay motivated is by understanding my purpose. Uh, acting and acting and singing is my job. That's not my purpose. My purpose is how I'm going to affect this world, how I'm going to move through it, how I'm going to help others. And I try to keep that at the forefront of my mind when, you know, moving forward. And uh, a gig that was taken away was, you know, I they had a clause in there about, you know, politics. And I was like, I'm always going to talk about that. I'm that that's not something that I'm not going to talk about. And I know I wear my agents out. I know. <laughs> I know, I know that they're so exhausted by me, but, <laughs> but I got it. I have to keep it real with myself. Um, let me see. Um, Uh, anonymous attendee, what is a book or podcast that you love or recommend? Um, Cleaning Up the Mental Mess and The Perfect You by Dr. Caroline Leaf. She's a neuroscientist that um, actually specializes in mental health and how the brain works and how your brain and your mind are different and how it affects your, your body. Um, and it's, she's, she's absolutely brilliant, just absolutely brilliant. Um, she also has a, a podcast too. So I would rec recommend her podcast. I also love NPR. Um, uh, and yeah, those are it. I'm planning on starting my own podcast eventually. So hopefully you guys will listen in. What was it like attending the Black Lives Matter matter rallies last summer man it was it was inspiring um attending those uh rallies really I learned a lot I went to a lot of and not just the rallies I went to a lot of uh uh meetings with the city and sat into some of the city council meetings to see how things are ran and a lot of it went over my head but <laughs> I did understand some of it and now know how things are brought to the to the floor and how they vote and like I I learned so much and it was it was really inspiring to see and also a little scary at times um, to know how ugly this world can be but seeing how people of different colors races backgrounds all came together because it wasn't just black people at these rallies and honestly when one of us is affected all of us are and I I cannot wait until this world understands that. Um, let's see the next question. Do you ever feel nervous to negotiate terms as a black woman? 
I recently let a com- I recently let a company use my content for free because I was scared the opportunity will be taken away from me. And now I kind of regret it. <laughs> um, Fatima. Um, there, there are different stages in life that we're all going to have to walk through. And sometimes the stage is going to be for free, girl. <laughs> sometimes it will be. Um, sometimes I, I think you just go with what is comfortable for you. Don't regret it because you already did it. And hopefully it's going to bring some attention to what it is that you do. Hopefully they gave you love and, you know, um, cited where they got it from. And if not, take it as a lesson learned. And the next time, be more prepared. You know, even if you have to, what I started having to do when I advocated for myself was I had to start writing stuff down and just reading off of a paper (laughs) so that I didn't flub over my words and I sounded as confident as possible. So write down what it is that you want to see next time and be prepared. But, you know, don't be hard on yourself though, because we all have to start somewhere. Um, Who are the artists or authors you aspire to be like when you were growing up? Well, I aspire vocally to be like Whitney Houston and Shaka Khan. That's all all that I listened to when I was younger. (laughs) Love them both. Um, I aspire to be as knowledgeable and an eloquent writer and speaker as Maya Angelou and James Baldwin. I just, reading James Baldwin books and his brain the way that he would speak about such ugly things with such beautiful and poetic language I have never experienced anything any any writing like it there's no writing like James Baldwin and Maya Angelou I've never read it's the first time that I've read anything that made me cry um so much passion and love behind her words and love for women in in general um feels like a big hug when you read her her poetry and so those are two three people I aspire to be like (laughs) um Nev, is it Neve or Nev? I think it's Neve. You mentioned before about wanting to bring back traditional theater. How would you plan on doing this in today's society when everything is so fast paced and modernized? By the way, I'm such a big fan. Thank you. Um, honestly, I really want to bring Dream Girls to live TV. That's what I'm working on right now, how they've been doing like a lot of the um, stuff live. Uh, and I really want to do Dream Girls. I won an Olivier in the UK for doing it. And I just want to bring it to the US. So I think that's it. It's about 12 o'clock. Um, so I think that that about brings us to the end of uh, the hour that we had carved out for today. But um, thank you. Thank you to the participants for asking all these great questions. And thank you, Amber, so much for giving us your time today and being a part of our conference. We're so grateful and so appreciative. And thank you to Tony, our executive director, for bringing us together, um, you know, (laughs) and and helping us make this this happen. We're so grateful that we were able to put on this conference um, in the midst of a pandemic. So thank you again, everybody, for your time. Thanks, Amber. Thank you, everyone. Have an amazing, amazing day. My roommate wants to say hi. Oh my God, <laughs> hi. I love you so much. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. I appreciate you so much. Thank you for having <laughs> me. Hopefully this won't be the last time. This was really fun. And I hope the rest of the conference goes off swimmingly. Thank you so much. Yes, I really hope to connect in the future. Reach out anytime. I will. <laughs> I love your work and you're an amazing person and I love your spirit and energy. So thank you for bringing that thank today. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye Amber.